All right. Hello, everyone. Hope you're all enjoying the conference today. My name's Jonathan LeBlanc. I lead developer evangelism in North America at PayPal. And uh, a lot of my career, I've worked as both a consumer of, uh, of the APIs as well as a producer of them. I've worked on a lot of different projects back in, in multiple different co companies like PayPal, like Yahoo, CBS Sports before then, where we've developed a lot of different API infrastructures. And what we've noticed over, the, over those years is that JavaScript API development has changed quite a bit, as well as it's always the most complicated model that you're going to build out. The infrastructure that you're going to build in a server-side implementation is going to be do, uh, going to be workable throughout multiple different languages, but there's a lot of considerations that you have to put in when designing a JavaScript API. Now, a lot of those capabilities have to do with a, a few core details. Some aspects of automation and some aspects of security. You're working with the browser model here and the browser security model, so there's a lot of additional complexities that you have to work with in order to get your API infrastructure working and make it not a complex or horrible experience for the end developer. So what am I talking about when I'm explaining automation? It's not the aspects of having everything done for you. It's the aspects of reducing a lot of the complexities to allow you to build a stateful infrastructure on your, on your developer side. Building out a, a nice and easy implementation to allow your developers and your end users not to have a hacked experience and not to have to go through every single hoop in order to ma make it work. We've gone through years of that in the past and our tool sets now are so much better than they ever were. So this is everything that we're going to be talking about today and looking at automation, aspects of security. Now, how many of you here work with JavaScript on a regular basis? Good, a large portion of you. So if you think back to when you first started consuming APIs or first started doing development on, a, on JavaScript, I know this was my general experience. This is how I felt when I was working with JavaScript. It felt like a horrendous experience because I kept getting messages as I was con consuming APIs back in the early days saying, oh, hey, you can't make that cross-domain request because of the same origin policy, or there's some complexity here that wasn't, uh, uh, wasn't in the Python uh, SDK or, uh, or the PHP implementation. And these are all the things that we want to try to avoid, the things that we, we need to be able to have a good working infrastructure for in order to get, uh, get anyone building on top of them. So that all comes down to a, core, a few core concepts of JavaScript challenges. So as we're building out our JavaScript APIs, we're building them out for our end developers. And there's certain challenges that are different in J uh, JavaScript API development that are not there in a server-side implementation. And when we were building out a lot of these hacked implementations within, within Yahoo infrastructures, when I was building out a, a JavaScript uh, API implementation to work with our social initiatives. This was maybe four years ago, three, four years ago. We had to work on some sort of hacked implementation because the web wasn't really ready for, uh, or really didn't have the standards for allowing a lot of these capabilities without some proprietary approach to it. And there were a lot of things we did back in the day, and it was all because of these JavaScript challenges. First and foremost, same origin policy. Every single time I'm working with a, a developer who's new to JavaScript development, they always send me the same message, and it's always the same thing. And how many of you here are familiar with the uh, same origin policy? Okay, for those of you that aren't, it's basically the, Java, uh, the browser security model will restrict API requests through to other domains or subdomains. So when you're making requests through, you have to find a different method for almost pipelining towards that uh, server side or that uh, API endpoint. So these are the complexities that you're going to have to deal with on a regular basis. And these are the aspects where a security model, a proper security model built into your JavaScript SDK and built into your API infrastructure need to be able to support. We've had every single workaround known to man just to bypass this security model when realistically we shouldn't be bypassing it, we should be working with it. And we're finally at the stage now where there's some really good security technology out there for working with these JavaScript APIs. 
then the aspects of keeping private keys private. Now, for those of you who have used OAuth, or any implementation key, a, a basically a key architecture or an access token architecture, we'll be familiar with the aspects of uh, passing through a consumer key and a consumer secret in order to get an access token, which is your, like your skeleton key for grabbing data. But it's the same principle as I said, using basic auth to pass through a username and password. That password aspect or your consumer secret needs to be kept secret. If you're embedding it with directly within your JavaScript within a variable, it's not secret. And then anyone can hijack your potential session and then utilize your application, uh, application on top of that. So you want to be able to keep these mechanisms secure. So these are really the aspect, these two aspects, the uh, same origin policy and the private keys that, that really make this pursuit complex. And these are the things that we had to build out, for, build out ourselves back in the day. And then finally, not providing this hacked experience to your, to your developers, to your end users. Now, when I, in my tenure over at Yahoo, um, probably about six months before I, I left, um, I had one project manager that came up to me and said, oh no, we, we can just do this in a difficult way, basically with an OAuth 1 day. And if any of you have used OAuth 1, you'll understand exactly what I'm talking about with this, this kind of horrible, difficult experience for the developers. There was a lot of complexities built into it. But they didn't want to take an easier pursuit for the developers because if the developers wanted the data, they would consume it anyways. But that's a horrible assumption to take on your developers where you're putting the onus on them to, to find a way of consuming your data instead of making it an easy pursuit for them. So what we are trying to do here is, provide, is to remove a lot of the complexities within your development environment, within your security, because they do not need to be there. There are tools available that allow you to, to work with the browser security models and provide a solid API infrastructure for, for consuming that data. Now, you've heard me say this a couple of times already, but this is, whenever I'm talking about the history of the security models, uh, JavaScript security, API security, I found the, uh, the perfect picture for how I feel every single time. This is how, when you're de describing the history of API development, especially within the JavaScript layer, this is how you end up feeling. Because even though these experiences happened in the last five years, where API development has, has changed so significantly on the front end, to the point where you no longer have to provide a really horrible experience for your end developers, you can provide a streamlined approach. But just in the same way that you need to understand where, where you're coming from, it's the same way with JavaScript development and de development of the SDKs, the APIs. You have to understand the ways that it used to be. I mean, this I'm not even talking about years ago. Some of these are still put in practice today. So we used to use things like server-side proxies. You, and I've seen a lot of APIs now that do the exact same thing. They would offer you a JavaScript SDK, and they would say, oh, by the way, if you're using the JavaScript SDK, you have to put this server-side proxy script in I say, PHP, Python, Node, in order to proxy the private request back and forth. Well, what's the friggin' point of having a JavaScript SDK if you, if you have a server-side component that has to proxy all the requests through? The whole point is to have the entire experience right there for the developers and not have the onus on the developers to have this server-side component. But there's plenty of APIs still to this day that do exactly this. Then, Flash and iframe proxies. These ones were really fun back, back several years ago. When um, I was first doing Facebook API development, uh, they used some components like this. Um, on YUI development, when I was wor working at Yahoo, they, uh, YUI 2x libraries, and they used uh, for their cross-domain requests a Flash proxy. So when you would download the library and you wanted to make these cross-domain requests, they would give you this little flash file that would work as a proxying script in the exact same way as a server-side proxy would. So any information that you're funneling from the front end and the JavaScript layer all the way to the back end of the API endpoint, it would be funneled through the flash object. Well, it's an in, in, um, ingenious type of solution to fix this problem, but it's not necessary anymore. Then on Facebook's side, they implemented something that I thought was really cool back in the day. Um, when they were building out their, their APIs, uh, what they would do in some of their, their infrastructure is, as soon as you would load up that, that, uh, the SDK that they give you, 
it would drop a one-by-one -one pixel iframe on the page and allow communication through the iframe layer. So what a lot of these iframe proxies tended to do was they would manipulate the query string parameters in the iframe URI, so that would communicate back with, let's say, Facebook or PayPal or Yahoo or any other company. So that iframe would load up directly on that host site. So that would allow a communication bridge back and forth. But again, it's a workaround when there doesn't necessarily have to be one. And then finally, one of the other initiatives that, that we had done um, in some of our API development was providing a proprietary token storage mechanism. When we were working on OAuth 1 implementations uh, and, and the complexities behind that token passing, what we did in order to make a JavaScript SDK uh, viable was we in instead of using OAuth 1 implementation in, in and of itself, we kind of manipulated it a little bit because the front end technology, well, the front end implementation wasn't really there within the OAuth 1 implementation. So what we would do is instead of passing through your consumer key and consumer secrets in order to get an access token, that's again like your username and password but revocable, what we would do is the user would make a request from the front end and in, before hitting the endpoints, they would hit a intermediate step. The intermediate step would be our token storage. So it would look up uh, where the request is coming from, look up the application that the developer utilized, see if there's a match there, as well as a, co a couple of other security mechanisms, and then supplied into that request, if valid, the consumer secret. So that would either spit back an access, to uh, access token so they can make their own requests, or it would just spit back the data. So in this way, we were hiding the consumer secret to the end user. So again, it's another way that we found working, working around the problem. But again, you don't have to do this nowadays. It's just a, a small little piece of history that we don't have to put ourselves through anymore. And that's because we have much better ways of producing secure content negotiation. We have much easier ways for actually passing through this data. So in, in a lot of the development that I do nowadays, um, I see a modern approach as two pieces of technology. OAuth 2, which is, uh, well, it can't even be considered in the same, same right as OAuth 1 because it's so significantly different. It basically uses HTTPS to pass information back and forth whereas the onus in, uh, was on the developer back in OAuth 1 days to do a lot of the signing and security mechanisms on their side with hev heavyweight libraries. But OAuth 2 in, uh, has a nice little user agent flow uh, built into the specification that are not a lot of companies use. And what that allows you to do is have the, have the really nice aspects of token revocation within OAuth 2. So basically it allows the, the API or application provider themselves to revoke the application's access if they become malicious. It also allows a user who granted an application permission to access their details the right to revoke that access. So that's the whole purpose of using something like OAuth 2 because it allows this token revocation without supplying something like a username and password, which you can't revoke unless you change your account or change your password. So it's a much easier way of doing that. Then cross-origin resource sharing or cores is another mechanism that we're actually using within PayPal right now to build out our JavaScript implementation. So where OAuth 2 would have a user involvement step because the user has to give permission to the application to access their details, Cores is all about uh, allowing, an uh, allowing an application to access certain rights within the API and just the application, not the user. So in our way, we utilize it to validate whether an application is valid to make payment requests, to make authorizations, refunds, and all of that for an end user who supplies their details, like their payment information. So that way, we're able to not only validate the application, but we're also able to check the bandwidth usage. So, if they're, uh, so basically, if you're setting up an API, API using cores, you can monitor bandwidth usage on, on how, much, how much they're consuming so they don't just basically open up a giant pipe and suck down your data. That's the last thing you want. So these are two, I say, complementary uh, technologies within the world of, uh, of security on the JavaScript layer, and they work uh, with different aspects. So if you need a user involvement step, use OAuth 2. If you 
just need application verification and bandwidth checking and um, you know, rate limiting, use cores. And cores wasn't around for quite a while until very recently because the browsers really didn't support it. Well, one browser didn't support it. Certain browsers have been supporting it for quite a long time, which we'll see in a, in a little bit. Now, let's take a look quickly at the OAuth 2 user agent flow. I'm going to show you how it works because this is actually not that difficult. And going back and forth within, uh, within OAuth 2, it actually has just a couple of steps. So um, I'll just describe it, and then we'll go through it a little piece by piece. So when you have OAuth 2, you first build a redirect URI for the consumer. So they come into your site, you build a redirect URI, you forward them over to, let's say, PayPal, they sign in, they grant the application permission to access their details, then they're re redirected back to your site. This is where the server-side implementation and the, and the JavaScript implementation differ in the spec. In the JavaScript implementation, what's sent back along with the redirect is a hash mod. The hash mod contains information like the access token that you can, is basically your skeleton key for accessing their details. It's basically a grant that you can revoke at any time. All right, so within the uh, redirect flow, this is what it's going to look like. You have an authorization endpoint, and this is granted as well as the consumer key and consumer key secret. When you first go to, let's say, a site that has an API, and you sign up for an application, you're given these credentials, these OAuth2 credentials, as well as a series of endpoints. So the authorization endpoint will include your client ID, which is like your username, and your response type, which will always be token in this case because you want to get back the token. Your scopes are the information that you want to obtain from the user. So it could be a profile, it could be, uh, it could be any number of things depending on the API itself. The scopes here, this is not a required parameter um, because there's two different types of scopes that you can define. In this case, when you're including it, this is more like a Facebook model where you have dynamic scoping. So the scoping is defined as you, as you use it. And so you can change that on the fly. Then there's others that use static scoping, which are bound when you create the application. So you save the information that you need from the user within the application itself. And you have to update the application whenever you're, uh, you're changing scopes. And then there's others like PayPal that use a little bit of both. Now, you redirect the user with that information as well as a redirect URI. It's where to redirect the user back when they, when they actually grant permissions. So this is what it looks like in JavaScript. Let's say I had a button on the page, the user comes to the page, I can, I'll run this script right away. I'll, I'll create my auth URI, which will just be to my endpoint where I'm redirecting the user, and then I can just use jQuery to dump that, that um, auth URI, or that redirect URI, directly within the button's href. So now, when they click a login with PayPal, or login with, with whatever, then they're going to be redirected. So the user gets redirected, they grant the application permission, then they're redirected back. This is what this flow now looks like. You, you, within the URI itself of the redirect is going to be that hash mod containing an access token at bare minimum. It will also have, if, uh, if the access token does expire, it'll have refresh token and it expires in to tell you how long you have until it expires. Uh, and this changes depending on the API because some APIs use long-lived tokens which never expire. Other ones use short-lived tokens like we do that do expire and you can refresh uh, perpetually. So within the JavaScript layer, the uh, gray part at the top is the, what the URI would look like with the hash mod containing all the information that we just talked about. So all we need to do is call document.location.hash. We extract the hash mod. And then we can just run a quick little regex to pull apart the access token and whatever information we need. We can pull this apart any way we want, but really all we need to do is remove that data. Then we can start using it. So to use the access token, which is our permission to, create, to capture user information or capture any private details, all we have to do is include it within an authorization header. So the headers themselves will contain, uh, well, it'll be an authorization header containing the token type, which in this case will be OAuth. The token type basically describes how, how to uh, pass the information back and forth, and you know, basically the a, a encryption on how to, how to do that. Then the access is supplying the access token, which we just extracted. You can also supply the content type if you're looking for JSON. So specifically within a JavaScript implementation, you're looking for that JSON object coming back. So in jQuery world, this is what it's going to look like. 
you have a cross-domain AJAX request that you set up, so it's supplying your URI in there for where to make the request to for the privileged information. Again, that's an endpoint like getting profile information from PayPal or what have you. And then you supply a before send, and the before send will include all of your headers. So you would just say set request headers, supplying an authorization header, the token type of OAuth, and then the access token itself. And then you can supply an accept header for the, the, data, uh, the data type, so application JSON. Then on success, that's when the data actually comes back to you and you've just extracted privileged user information. And this is all on the JavaScript flow, utilizing the concepts of OAuth 2. And OAuth 2, for the vast majority of API implementations, is only server side. All right, now let's look at the flip side. This is the more complex model because you have entire concepts of token revocation. You really only need to do this when you're working with, um, with a user involvement, when you need to access their private info. If all you need to do is verify that an application uh, can indeed consume and utilize data, that's when you use cores. So cores is, uh, is it has just been a pleasure to work with, to be honest. And um, some of the issues that it's going to deal with and some of the things that we've used in the past to uh, utilize cores for, Obviously, we're utilizing this in much the same way as OAuth 2 to, uh, to work with the browser security models around the same origin policy. One of the things that we used to do in the, back in the day to support this was utilize JSONP. It's still a standard that's used, used in many, many places. Uh, it's basically returning a JSON object wrapped in a callback. Uh, so that allows you to basically just do HTTP GET requests. But the problem there is you can just do HTTP GET requests. Whereas cores does, has the same capability, but allows you the entire HTTP verbiage. Now, the reason why you actually want this is because in standard RESTful principles, and definitely when you're building out an API infrastructure, your HTTP verbs, your requests that are being sent through, should denote the type of operation that you're making. Your creates, your updates, your entire CRUD operations, that should be denoted by your, your gets, your puts, your posts, your delete. These should denote what information you want to do, like update a record or create a new record. So this is why you want this entire HTTP verbiage there. Now, I said we'd take a quick look at the browser version usage, but if you go to caniuse.com slash cores, you can actually see the current uh, viability of this, uh, uh, of this type of implementation. So as you can see, Chrome and Firefox, awesome. They've been supporting it for quite a while. Uh, IE10 supports it now. Um, IE9 and IE8, they have some caveats in there. So if you're using just a basic implementation like what, I, uh, what I'm going to show you, then uh, it shouldn't have a problem. But if you're doing a more complex integration, of course, it can have some issues. Now, how many of you here use Opera Mini? Every single time I've talked about cores, no one... Oh, you, you are the first person ever to raise their hand. Um, so basically... Since no one has raised their hand in the many times I've talked about cores, you can just forget about Opera Mini. <laughs> so the major browser usage, this is what you're looking at. Depending on your support usage, this is when you can use cores viably within these browser versions. And it's really dead simple to use. Let me show you. So basically, when you are sending an HTTP request through, so let's say I'm making a request through to an endpoint, all I would do is push through an origin header in addition to my request. Just like you saw when I was pushing through the access token within the OAuth 2 implementation, I was pushing through an authorization header. I could do the exact same thing with an origin header, supplying the domain that the request is coming from, basically my domain, where my application is. Then that's going to be spit off to the endpoint, not have to deal with the same origin policy. And the endpoint itself, let's say on PayPal's side, it would just validate where the request is coming from, validate against their application lookup. So take a look at the application, make sure that they match, as well as a few other little security mechanisms in place just to validate that the requests are coming from the same place, that there's nothing malicious, that the redirect URI is from the same location. And then all they would do is spit back a access control allow origin header with the same domain. Ta-da! You have data. That's it. That's cores. At a very basic level, that's all you really need to do is, is send these little headers through 
And you don't have to deal with the, uh, the complexities of the browser security model because it's working with the browser security model. It's not working against it like those old implementations that we used to use. So let's take a quick look at uh, some of the aspects of automation. The other thing that I, that I was talking about, security and automation. Really, in automation, you want to remove those complexities to allow the, the developer themselves to build a smart implementation of what, you're, what they're working on, utilizing your API. And there's a couple of ways that you can do this. Now, uh, how many of you have worked with REST APIs in the past? Right, good, good, good. So this shouldn't be a shock when I bring up some of the more intricate details of, of REST, which are uniform interface sub-constraints. Basically, a couple of different rules for working with the, uh, the implementations that are supplied. So there's four specific rules here, or four specific implementations. One, resource identification. The API provider has to be the ones that build out the, the endpoints. I mean, they would be building it out anyways. Um, and maintaining it. Then there's resources must be manipulated via representations. Basically means a concept that you're doing. Let's say I'm making a payment. That's a resource. And a representation is like a JSON object containing the state of the information that's going to update that. So resources, representations. Then self-descriptive messaging. If we're using standard REST HTTP principles all smacked together, then we're doing this anyway. So we're sending back proper response codes. We're sending back proper error messaging instead of a hack together implementation. So that one's a no-brainer as well. And then my favorite, hypermedia as the engine of application state, or Hadios. It's a very complicated, complicated name, um, very... Uh, but a very non-complicated uh, implementation. It's really not that complex when you look at exactly what it is, and we'll see exactly what it is, that it's, it's really not as difficult as it seems. So the two things that I want to look at here in building out an automation principle or building out an uh, anti-complexity principle here is the aspects of their resources and representations as well as Hadios. So let's take a look at Hadios first. So I, there's a lot of debates online, a lot of debates amongst people who consume and build REST APIs, whether, this, uh, whether the web's even ready for this, whether it's, it's viable as an implementation. And to be honest, I'm, um, I'm more leaning on the yes side, but I see a lot of the issues there. The, a lot of the issues uh, in, in this principle is that you're basically sending back all the data that a, um, that a developer might need to make any potential next step. So if I'm making, let's say, an authorization call, what's coming back from the Hadios links are any potential next step, like capture the funds, or void the authorization, or look up information. Simple concepts. But the best way to look at it is how we can normally consume APIs. Let's say we have an application in the middle, and everything around there is all the API endpoints that we might want to make requests to. So if we have an API infrastructure that, uh, you're, uh, that has to do refunds and, uh, and payments and all of that stuff, then we have to maintain a method state in there for actually consuming that data or hitting that endpoint. So every single call that we need to make has to be present in our application. But, and this is how we normally do it, how we're used to it. What I feel that Hadios gives us as, as a, a standard uh, is the ability to just maintain a uniform state to the first entry point. So let's use auth, and ca auth capture, so you're authorizing funds and later capturing them. Let's use that as an example. So my, I, the first entry point into my application is always going to be authorization. My potential next steps might be a capture, it might be lookup information, it might be void. When I capture the funds, uh, my next steps after that might be refunds, it might be, uh, it might be looking up information about the payment. But those steps can never be taken first. So refunds, captures, voids cannot be taken until that first step is, take, is, is made. So that first step being my authorization. So my application in and of itself should only need to maintain state information or, or capture information to that first entry point. Then every single API request should spit back all potential next steps for me to take in order to do anything else. So simply put, this is how it's going to work. You're going to make any sort of API request to an endpoint. This is just some generic endpoint to make an authorization, passing through, in this case, OAuth2 tokens. What gets spit back to me is an entire JSON object containing all the potential information about the authorization. It contains all the details that I might want. But 
Also baked into that JSON return is a JSON object containing all the potential links. And thankfully, with RESTful standards and stateless principles, all the information that's being spit back to me, uh, is, uh, I should have enough information to never have to make another lookup call. That should be everything that I need in order to make those requests. So in the case of authorization, we would have get uh, or the self, which would be looking up information about, it, uh, about the call that was just made, the capture, and the voids. So those are my potential next step, uh, steps. And in Hadeos, it has to return, uh, by the standard, it has to return at least one, uh, one link back. And that's usually a self link. So you'll have all the relevance. You'll have the uh, HTTP request method that you would need to, uh, to utilize in order to make it work. And so you have all the information that you need. Now, within object chaining, I, there's one thing here which I, I, I don't like that I think can be better. So in order to build out a nice, smart system, a nice hierarchy of, of uh, Hadios calls are really needed. So a way of telling automatically what's the next potential step. So the next potential step in an auth is a capture. So a hierarchy or a way of supplying a hierarchy in, in this type of implementation is something that can be done better because at this level, you have no idea what's, what's going to be made, uh, made next or what uh, programmatically you can make next. So these are aspects that, uh, that I'm going to show you in a second with, um, with some of the object chaining that, that we're actually going to utilize. So object chaining is a pretty important uh, concept when you're, you're removing a lot of complexities, because what you essentially want to do is build out a nice streamlined, uh, streamlined implementation to capture all your data all at once. And since the RESTful pr uh, principles st uh, have a stateless system, or the vast majority of RESTful implementations maintain stateless systems, which I'll, I'll show you in a second. Um, this actually allows us as implementers to maintain some sort of application state within our, our uh, programming principles to build out really nice change methodologies. So within a stateless system, this is what you technically should have. So if you're making a request to a system, or let's say the system is making requests to multiple layers on its own system for manipulating data, the stateless principle basically states that all the, uh, that all the information that's applied to that next layer or replied back to that, end, uh, that developer should be enough information to make a, uh, make a call on what to do next. You should not have to make another lookup call to figure out more information about the system. So it makes the returns larger, but the returns contain all the information that you might need for doing anything else. And that's where resources and representations come in as far as the RESTful uh, hypermedia constraints come in. So if we're manipulating a payment request, for instance, utilizing a JSON object of the state information, what should be returned back? Let's say I'm making an update on a payment, or I am creating a new payment. If, uh, what, what should be returned back to me at the end of the day from the API endpoint is the entire object of the newly created payment. It shouldn't just be a payment identifier. It should be all the information that I would need in order to, make, uh, to store that information locally or store it within my database or store it anywhere or utilize it within this object chaining principle. So where we're getting with resources, representations, and Hadios is to get something like this. So if we have a hierarchy of those Hadios links coming back, what we can do is we make an initial request to authorization it returns back all potential next steps as well as all the information. We create, let's say, a closure object supplying all the information that we might need within that single object, uh, and ne and ne potential next steps, and the potential next steps are driven by my Hadios links. So we make that initial call. We can say get next action, which would be a hierarchy of potential next steps. So it would take the next, next viable step without ever knowing what it might be. We just know it's the next logical step. And then we can just process that, uh, process that. So ideally, this is where we want to get to with this, these entire principles of, of JavaScript API development. We want to get to the, to the system where you remove the complexities, you, you allow the developers to build out a, a, a smarter system in order to reduce code and, and uh, future-proof their applications. Because if you have a system like this and the API changes, the program changes right along with it because all you have is maintaining state to the next logical step. So just to sum up some of these things, 
when we're actually looking at, uh, at, at these types of implementations, we have to have a proper security model that works with the browser security implementations. You can't have a hacked workaround like we used to back in the day. It's not viable anymore. You shouldn't put the onus on the developer to do that because they won't do it. They'll find some other API that, w that supplies them with a much easier implementation. Then, you should always assume statelessness within the application environment. When you're building out an API endpoint, statelessness actually makes sense because you know, even in the API implementation, even though they have a stateless architecture, you as the developer do not have to have that same statelessness. You can use the objects and all the information that's returned back to build out these smart systems to make your application future-proof. So you build it once and you ha never have to touch it. And then, obviously, the end, end goal here is we're removing complexities, we're making it easier and streamlined for developers to start working with these systems on the JavaScript layer. I mean, it's a no-brainer at the end of the day that you want your developers to easily consume this data. Utilizing cores, utilizing OAuth 2, utilizing RESTful, uh, standard RESTful principles that are there anyways allows you to do that. So thank you very much, everyone. My uh, slide deck is up on speaker deck if you want to gra uh, if you want to grab it. Thank you. Uh, and I'm open for questions. Where can you raise your hand? Oh, yeah. Uh, correct. So the, the question was, uh, I, do I mean statelessness on the server side versus uh, statelessness on the client side? So yes. So what I'm basically saying is in the API itself, so let's say on PayPal's infrastructure, the entire infrastructure for communicating with, um, with its own internal system should be stateless. So you're passing back all information that it needs. But when you spit back the information to the end user, that should still be stateless. So you should still have the complete object sent to the end user. The end user themselves, the develop or the developer themselves, should, can maintain state from that object. Yeah, so this... Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the information within uh, RESTful principles within uh, a stateless architecture basically states that you can't have stored methodologies. You cannot have uh, any stored lookups for actually making that next call. So that information has to be returned back from that. So you you have to have enough information to make any potential next step. So that's all it is. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes. And expiration for the for the access token. Um, it, it may be very well that you don't want to uh, put your user, your end user, your human user, through the process of updating the, the token uh, when when it expires. So, what is your your recommendation for the right strategy in the client to uh, seamlessness uh, updating this uh, token? Yeah. So the, the question was, um, uh, you don't want to have to put the user through the uh, step of actually refreshing the token, so basically re-signing in and re-granting permissions. Um, and so what's the best strategy? The good news is that OAuth 2 has that strategy built in. So the refresh token, what it does is, um, in that last step where you saw I was making that, uh, that jQuery cross-domain request, let me actually bring that up. Uh, boop, boop, boop. So in this, requ uh, in, in this request here. So I'm making this cross-domain request to basically um, uh, capture, the, the, uh, uh, capture the access token or utilize the access token. In the same way, when I'm refreshing the token, I would just make a request uh, just like this in the back, uh, in my, uh, without the user involvement to the, uh, to the API endpoint of the server. So let's say I'm making a request to PayPal utilizing something like this, passing through my refresh token. Uh, and all the information that it might need, access token, refresh token, and it automatically supplies me back with an, another access token. The user doesn't have to be involved. So the uh, OAuth 2 in and of itself uh, supplies that already, so you can refresh the token without the user involvement step. So you have to implement this logic in your app, in the client, in the client app? 
uh, so the yeah, so you have you have to implement this in in a client app. But uh, what you really want is to have this built into a uh, an SDK that's is supplied to the end developer. So you want this logic to be streamlined as well. Hmm. Any other questions? All right. Well, I'll be hanging around here for the rest of the day. If anyone wants to chat, thank you. <laughs>